So I'm Dina Halick. I am the head of the fiction department here at Central Library. To be more specific, I'm the head of uh, the science fiction and fantasy section of the fiction department. So my job is pretty much perfect. And uh, I am very excited today to welcome to the stage three authors. First off, we have Kevin Hearn, who is the author of the urban fantasy series, The Iron Druid Chronicles. <laughs> Next, we have Chuck Wendig. I feel like I don't have to tell you what he's done, because he's done everything. And third, we have Fran Wild. And uh, just so you know, Fran's novella, The Jewel and Her Lapidary, is a finalist for the Hugos in the novella category this year. Voting closes tomorrow. Okay, welcome to the stage, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Is this thing on? <clears throat> Hi. How are you? Should I just yeah, just pull it close. Swing it. All right. Ooh, tech. Hi, hometown. <laughs> Fran is our Philly girl. Okay, so I've got a few questions I'm going to ask. Knowing these three, they will probably head off on a tangent. We will try to pull them back. At the end, we will have questions from the audience, so get your questions ready, and they will be happy to answer them. And afterwards, upstairs in the lobby, we will have signings for all of their books. So it's going to be a fun... Gravity yeah. is a really... Gravity. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, because you're just sitting down. You don't really need it right now. Totally you're good. Care. You dropped your water, too. <laughs> This is a good start to the night. <laughs> right, so I am assuming a lot of you know one, two, or all three of these people, so I'm not going to uh, explain what all their works are. I'm sure we will get it from context as we go along. Uh, Kevin, hi. 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 I want to know where the people are that have these reserved seats. <laughs> What's going on? I, I think one of them's reserved for me, but then I got to do this instead, and I figured okay. this was a better seat. So. All right. Just wondering where the fancy people are that have reserved have no seats at the library. Here. You know what I mean? Let's tear them down. <laughs> tear down the wall. If nobody shows up in the next 10 minutes, you get to move over. <laughs> <laughs> Those seats vibrate, so. So, Kevin, <laughs> and this is why we are not going to get many questions in. <laughs> So Kevin, now I have to say, I hadn't read Kevin's books. I just finished Hounded the other day, and now I'm annoyed because I have eight more books to read. Um, but what was really interesting about Kevin's books is you deal with the Irish pantheon of gods, and that's not something that we usually get like the Morrigan or something like that, but we really don't get any of the others, and it was a learning experience for me. Why did you decide to go Irish? Well, uh, partly it was because um, I'm a wee bit Irish myself, but um, also I was just really fascinated by their particular pantheon because the Irish pantheon is different from what you might consider continental Celtic and sort of the, you know, the sort of thing you might find in a, a regular Celtic uh, sort of knick-knack kind of shop. It's not necessarily all Irish. Kernunos, for example, is a very popular sort of Celtic god, but he's not really an Irish one. Um, that was uh, something that the continental druids kind of uh, adhered to. So the two of the Danon are your original Irish uh, pantheon. They, we, they were supposed to be originally just magicians that came to Ireland and uh, defeated the Firbolgs and the Fomorians. But then once they were displaced by some humans who had iron instead of bronze, and that iron was the antithesis of their magic, then they went underground and then they became the Fae. They became the, you know, worshipped as the Fae, as deities, and then all of their progeny and so on were just, you know, the Fae in general, the different kinds of fairies, what have you, spriggans and boggarts and whatever you have. But I thought the two of the Danon were very vastly uh, just, just underrepresented in fiction. Uh, nobody had really ever written about Angus Og. Um, you did see things about Briet or the Morgan, but Nothing about Angus Og or nothing about Mananon MacLear. Uh, you didn't see uh, Flittish anywhere except in the old Irish things. And I'm like, well, what if we can, you know, bring some of that to a larger audience? Um, and so that's kind of why I went there. Uh, also, I really admired um, how the Irish uh, pantheon has quite a few 
uh, women in it who share power or just dominate rather than the typical patriarchal uh, kind of pattern you see in other pantheons. Uh, Flittish, for example, is the uh, exact copy of Artemis and Diana with the very crucial difference that instead of being a virgin goddess, she has as much sex as she wants and you'd better not shame her or even attempt to shame her for it because you'll be done. Um, and and that's, it, that was something about pagan Irish culture that was very different, uh, vastly different from you know, what we have now when, you know, once the, the Christians came in. And, and changed everything. So I wanted that to be out there as well. So that's kind of why I went there. Well, that leads to my next question. And I know that I took you a little aback when I asked this backstage is as a woman who reads urban fantasy a lot, I would assume that, or it feels like most of the books are written by women with strong female characters. And here you are coming in and writing in a genre that I would consider predominantly female. Mm -hmm as a guy with a male main character. Do you, do you feel that? Do you, do you kind of adjust how you write in any way? Is your fan base or your I, fellow authors? I actually don't know if my fan base, it seems to me to be pretty even, um, and also pretty wide age range. I've, I've uh, saw some folks last night, for example, that were you know in retirement, and then I, I had a kid who's 11 years old. So I, I, I have a huge range of readers, and that's kind of what I was hoping for, that I'm not really trying to aim at one uh, area because I have a kind of universal uh, message going on about not just religious tolerance, but religious acceptance. Uh, let's, we're all just trying to be better folks, and whatever path we're, we're on is, is all good, you know? So um, I want that message to be I guess, palatable to as many folks as possible, and I don't really think about um, trying to uh, narrow uh, what I'm doing there. Um, but in terms of the urban fantasy genre, um, I actually really, uh, I guess there are quite a few uh, uh, women writing in the field, and that's awesome. I love um, hanging out with them, and I think they're hilarious. And um, we're gonna be at NOLA StoryCon in New Orleans uh, in September, and I think I'm like, I don't know, I guess I'm one of like two author, male authors that are there, but it's all... It's, That's it's not going to be any fun for you at all. <laughs> well, no, I mean, everybody's married. It's not like that, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's just, uh, we're, we're all just chilling out and we're friends, you know? We know each other um, professionally and it's going to be a great time because uh, we get to go tour the, the cemeteries where Marie, Marie Laveau is buried and stuff like that, so... Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I just have a, a great time in the genre period. It's fun. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and like, you're known for urban fantasy. As I was digging around, I realized you actually wrote a Star Wars book as well. Oh, yeah, I wrote Heir of the Jedi. That's kind of awesome. And I'm going to uh, use that to kind of lead over to Chuck. And just the first question, and I think both of you can answer this because you've done both, is uh, you all know Chuck wrote the Aftermath series, right? Okay. I did. <laughs> True. So what is... <laughs> what are the pros and cons of writing in a, a universe that is established versus one that you make up yourself? Go, Chuck. <laughs> All right. Let's Because there are some there, people who know a lot about Star Wars. Star Wars? Ah. Live long and prosper, everybody. <laughs> Did I say Star Trek? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Stargate. That was Stargate. Uh, man, no, I don't know. Uh, I write a lot of books. Uh, most of them are not Star Wars, as it turns out. Um, and that's great. I love to do that because you control everything. Um, for the most part, you get this great, you know, totally empty, uh, uh, you know, playing field. And you can do whatever you want. You can play whatever game you want and tell whatever story you want. Um, and then when they come to you with Star Wars... Uh, it's different than you think. At least it was different for me. They didn't approach me and say, here's like the outline, here's the story you're going to write about, you know, Han Solo losing his virginity on the moons of... Like, what? No, I didn't want to write that. Um, they gave me really no um, hard outline. They gave me kind of a, a fence in which to roam. Uh, they said, you have to write this series, and it's set between... Uh, the end of Return of the Jedi and the beginning of The Force Awakens, and we can't really tell you anything about Force Awakens, so good luck with that. <laughs> uh, like, seriously, sometimes they would be like, we need you to put a character in there, and his name is Snap Wexley. I'm like, oh, is Snap Wexley like a human or an alien? And like, we can't tell you. <laughs> I was like, but I need to know, because I'm pretty sure the fans are going to get mad at me if I get that wrong. 
So, uh, and that sort of leads into part of the thing, right? Because like, writing in Star Wars is exciting. Having this whole preset universe and having these sort of defined characteristics and characters is great fun because it's a, a place that I've kind of been living in my head since I was four years old. Um, but it also does expose you to a much bigger fan base, which is great. For the most part, great. Uh, occasionally also very overwhelming <laughs> because, you know, my books, I'm like, oh, I sold, like, you know, so many books in this one. Like, oh, I sold this many Star Wars books. That's just better until I start getting emails. I'm like, no, it wasn't better. It wasn't better. Some people are very mad. They get very <laughs> mad about very particular things, um, and they can be a wide variety of things. I'm not just talking about, like, one, like, the spaceship you used. You didn't describe it right. It was the wrong thing, or they couldn't have gotten in hyperspace at this particular amount of time. And you get very lengthy emails about that. And then also about the political side and the social side of Star Wars, what Star Wars means to them, and maybe they're kind of empire fetishists and I killed the empire, or maybe I killed their old Star Wars books because now it's a new Star Wars canon and the old canon exists and I burned them personally. So it, the one side, you know, yeah, I have these books that I wrote, that I controlled, that I did everything for, that has a, a comfortable, nice audience that I like. And then Star Wars which is this great place that I've wanted to live for a very long time. Uh, and I got to do all this great stuff in it. And, but it also exposes you to a lot of amazing fans and a lot of very interesting fans as well. So that was new. I didn't expect that exactly. Okay, what so was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something about Star Wars. Yeah, the pros and cons of writing in oh. your own universe or an established universe. Oh, okay. Well, um, I really enjoy, obviously, writing in my own... Uh, universe because I make up all the rules, which are, you know, that's fantastic. Um, and in Star Wars, yeah, I, I grew up with that too. I was seven years old when the first uh, movie came out. And then when I was 12, Empire Strikes Back came out. And I'm watching Luke Skywalker summon the lightsaber to his hand upside down in the Wampa Cave. And I just, I, you know, I've got my popcorn and my soda and all that. And I just kind of spit up. How did he learn to do that? You know, <laughs> where, where did he ever learn that? And it was never explained because at the end of Star Wars, he could hardly do anything. Like, well, I can kind of feel the Force. You know, he had that whiny thing going on too. And then by the time he, he meets Yoda, he's like, "But I've learned so much." <laughs> you know, and so he's this whiny kid the whole time. And I'm like, well, how did he ever get skilled enough to do that thing in the Wampa Cave? So when they came to me and said, "You want to write that bit?" I'm like, "Yeah." I get to answer the question that had plagued me ever since I was a wee lad. So that was like a geek dream come true, where I get to kind of explore how he grew in the Force between you know, Star Wars, where all of the Jedi are now dead, because we learn that later through the prequels, right? Order 66 wiped them out. So nobody's teaching him, and he hasn't met Yoda, yet he's learned so much! So I've got to fill in that blank and that was the fence that I got to play in you're, you're in that time but then I also could not use holographic Ben uh, that was the other constraint no long conversations or any conversation really with Ben so because this was directly after he uh, blew up the, the Death Star so you'll, you'll actually hear him or see him say that a couple times I don't really know now if I heard that or if I imagined it you know because I've not been having any more conversations and then what they did, I, I didn't know why they told me to do that, but then I figured out later they had a plan. When the Star Wars comic started coming out, that was when Ben, they had Ben talk to him at the very end of the first issue. And that was the first time Ben had said anything to him since um, the Death Star blew up. So I'm like, okay, now I get it. You know, so they did have a, they are, one of the things that's cool about the continuity thing is that they are, they are actually coordinating events between novels and comics and the, the animated series and all of that kind of stuff. Whereas before it was just like, yeah, do whatever you want. And there was contradictions built in and now they're trying to make sure there's continuity. Yeah, um, <laughs> to your point about whole life. Like, Luke doesn't know what the hell's going on, and suddenly he has random powers. Um, like, I got, you know, you hear that argument that, like, Rey from The Force Awakens is a Mary Sue, because she suddenly knows what she's doing, and she can lightsaber fight at the end. It's like, Luke, in A New Hope, one minute he's getting stung on the ass by a little, like, droid. Pss, 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 and then next thing he's blowing up the entire Death Star <laughs> with, like, the Force. He's, so I was like, really? He's the, he's the Mary Sue. <laughs> Luke is the Mary Sue, guys. 
Yeah, right. The, like that battle droid owned him. Yeah. But then yet he's like, oh, I'm going through this Tourette's and all that stuff, and it's fine, you know? That, yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually don't want to throw any more uh, smoke on the fire here. <laughs> <laughs> Jewel on the fire here. We're slowly moving our chairs to yeah, the side. Just yeah. To go. Totally fine. So this this Star Wars stuff is very very the kids like intense. it. Intense. Yes. <laughs> I had another Star Wars question. I won't ask it. So Fran, you have no connection to Star Wars whatsoever. Absolutely no connection that I can talk about currently. No, no. But I. <laughs> But I, I was thinking about this, and this is something I forgot to mention before. I, I have been writing for Serial Box this um, season, which is a smaller universe, and the, the continuity thing came into it. Um, there is somebody in charge for Serial Box for the witch who came in from the cold. I don't know if anybody has been following this, but it is a Cold War spy um, episode, episodically told story. It's in its second season. I was the guest writer this year. And there is one person who is in charge of managing 16 writers across two seasons with um, Cold War spy episodes and witchcraft going on at the same time across parallel universes. It's not the same as managing movies, comics, and novels, but it is still very intense, and I just am very impressed that that level of cat herding has been reached in Those genre. aren't just cats, they're cats on fire. They're cats on fire <laughs> with like lasers coming out of their heads. Laser cats on fire. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, Fran, you actually, like, the Star Wars universe is ongoing. There is no end in sight. Fran, you're the author of a trilogy. It has a definite end. It so does. <laughs> so Fran wrote the... I, um, I really, it has a distinctive end, and it's done. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So she has, the first two books are out, Updraft mm -hmm. and uh, Cloudbound. Horizon is coming out in another few months. Yes, And September. so what is it like writing a closed end <gasps> series as opposed to something that is an open-ended or indefinite series. You guys know that feeling of, you know, I've sold a novel or I've, I've got a novel that I'm, I'm going to write and I'm going to have like six or seven more novels after it so I can truly explore the world. No, it is so great to be done. <laughs> it's wonderful. It is, um, I get to see the full arc of this world. There is this thing that I can hold in my brain and say, this is the story. And having that concluded, I love this world, I love playing in this world, I will probably revisit it in short stories and some you know, future opportunities or backstories, but having this one arc finished in three books has been the most amazing feeling, and I'm really glad to be able to say, yay, this is the whole thing all together. You can have the last one on September 26th and pre-order. <laughs> Sales are important, right? <laughs> it's just, it's the story, getting to, like, the, the whole story in my head is, was something that I knew from the beginning how it, I didn't know how it ended, but I knew where I was going. I knew that, and, and this is something that is going to come out in a couple of weeks. I was talking with Tommy Arnold about the covers for, for Updraft and Cloudbound and Horizon, and they change in color, but you also see the character in, in Updraft is looking down, and the character in Cloudbound is looking sort of horizontally. The character in um, Horizon is looking up. And that was, we all knew where this was going to go. And the fact that it pulled off in three years is, is kind of cool. That's impressive. Yeah. Do you have like some closet somewhere that's full of stickies and little lines connecting everything? I have a, I have a, a notebook stack uh, of drafts that is this big. I have a whole sheet of um, three by five cards that are the original outlines for updraft. I have a lot of, there's a lot of trees that died for this series. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, trees. But. And yours is a fairly uh, teen book. It's, it's YA. Um, it is crossover, so it, it was published as an adult book, and there are um, adult themes, but it is um, one of those where the characters are younger, and they are engaged in, in moving through. Updraft is definitely a building through in part, in part um, the theme for Kirit is finding her voice. The, the whole theme for Updraft is essentially voice, who gets heard, who gets to speak, um, but in the same time, there's a lot of heavy-duty politics and environmental stuff that's going on. So it, it really does, I have an audience that is, for, is, I think, 12 to 60 at this point, which is pretty exceptional. And then Cloudbound, I took some heat because I switched narrators. And um, a lot of people very publicly didn't like that because they liked Kirit so much and they liked her voice. And I love Kirit. Kirit's great. Kirit's stubborn. Kirit fought me every bit of the way. If I was going the wrong way, she wouldn't, I wouldn't, 
she wouldn't write. And that was fantastic, but I wanted to explore a different section of the world through a second character. And um, that they're a little bit older, they're learning a little bit more, they're learning about leadership. And then in the third book, which is Horizon, I got to explore the idea of community. And because everybody was so delighted that I switched characters for the first two, I've got three first person point of view characters for this one because I just like to tempt fate so much more. Um, and that was really extraordinary because I wrote each character thread as its own arc, um, one by one, and then wove them together. And then when I did revisions, I re revised them chronologically. Hmm. It was, it was, it was a big learning curve for me as well as craft wise. And un unlike Kevin, you weren't starting from a point of there is a pantheon that you can pull from. And I unlike Chuck, in the Star Wars books. There, that wasn't there to begin with, so this is all out of your brain, huh? This is all out of my brain. The, um, the, there are a lot of components that are things that I love. I love flying, I love wind, I love um, birds especially, especially big monstrous birds. I adore monsters. Um, so just being able to play with those elements, but especially the wind. And um, being able to play with concepts of community and and who has power and who doesn't is it has been um, with this particular world really fun to explore speaking of power and who has it and who doesn't <laughs> uh -oh. let's talk about the role of science fiction and fantasy and <laughs> these uncertain times that we are in right now you guys have opinions <laughs> no, we have no. absolutely no opinions. We're completely opinion-free up here. This is the opinion-free zone. Chuck? Oh, oh God. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know. You know, science fiction and fantasy has the value, um, on the one hand, of simply being a wonderful escape. And I see nothing wrong with periodically wanting to escape, because I don't know if anyone has turned on like, the news or looked at social media but it's just like a clown car vomiting clowns. Just on the, and they're on fire, and they have lasers. And then there's cats. And it's not good. So having science fiction and fantasy as a thing to escape to, um, and a thing, um, you know, something that I think is present in particularly both of their books, both in Kevin and Fran's books, something that has an aspirational component, um, something that literally isn't going to use some of the more upsetting um, tropes and themes and things we might expect from the real world, quote unquote, or that you might have seen in fantasy prior or in science fiction prior. Um, they're trying to escape the gravity of that. So you have some real value there, and they can be um, in terms of lessons or in terms of exploring new ideas as opposed to old ideas. Um, but then also science fiction and fantasy has a great way of contextualizing um, the disgorgement of fire clouds. <laughs> That. Try tweeting that, disgorgement of fire clowns. All of you tweet it right now. <laughs> now. Do you want to? Um, you know, I think it's changing. I think that it's not necessarily, um, you, you get discussions of the power dichotomy and people losing power and people gaining power. I think in actuality what's happening um, in sci-fi and fantasy especially, is there's a broadening of power. So there's many more voices coming in, and there are many more opportunities to be heard in different places. So you have short story markets that are publishing flash fiction, um, which is fantastic for discovering new, new work. You have anthologies coming out all of the time that are exploring different themes. Um, YA authors are trying different things with adult fiction. Adult fiction writers are, are you know, looking at ways to um, use hypertext. There was a very cool hypertext that, I don't know how many of you saw it, that came out, um, The Future of Football, that was just phenomenal last week. And, and I cut my teeth on hypertext way back in the, <laughs> and it was, um, it was for me, part of learning how to program was learning how to write narrative um, using code. And so seeing all of these new voices come in using different technologies and different story links from Flash through novellas and novelettes to the new writers coming up for the Campbell, there's some really exciting voices, not just within the US, but also from Africa and Europe, um, from Southeast Asia. There is this amazing steampunk anthology from Southeast Asia that's out from um, Rosarium Press, and I'm blanking on the name right now, but it's extraordinary. And just being able to capture all of that as well as incorporating the, the golden era of science fiction and be saying, okay, this is, this is us now. We are more than what we were is, I think, a distinct shift of power balance. 
Um, maybe people aren't so comfortable with it. Maybe people want to keep the power balance, which makes it okay to make jokes and slurs, but I don't think so. I think everybody's sort of moving towards that broader voice. Yeah, I think if we're uh, going to be speculative fiction authors, perhaps we could speculate for folks about worlds that are maybe a little bit better. I'm not saying a utopia, but maybe a little bit better than the one we have so we can help, ourselves, help everybody imagine how are we going to get ourselves to that better place. Because if you continue uh, to simply make everything sort of horrible all the time, uh, where's the escape in that? And we are trying to escape it's a little bit. It's a flaming somewhat, laser you know? cat-topia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let, let's, well, maybe we have the laser cats and, and the fire clowns, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're a little bit tamer. I don't know. Uh, but, There's but your I, writing prompt for the evening. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, some things that I, I, I noticed, some patterns and some things that... Uh, that were sort of just out there, available to read, and uh, I thought I, I stopped reading them. If if I am getting any sort of violence against women, I'm done. I would like to see a different world, please, thank you. And there's a lot of other books to choose from. If I see anything a storyline that has to do with slavery, I'm done. Um, I would like to see a better world, please. Let's deal. Now I I think those things should be dealt with and can be dealt with well. But what I have read to this point was not done well, and I don't want to waste my brain on it, you know? So uh, that's, that goes for my writing. Uh, I don't want to write uh, about those things either. And of course, I'm not the only person doing this. Um, of course, there are uh, women and people of color who are writing fantastic stuff um, all the time that are better worlds and, and more equal and so on. Um, but uh, I, that's something that I've been uh, yearning for as well. So um, that's what I've been thinking about recently. Well, then let's look to the future. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about what's coming up next for you guys. Fran, what's next? Um, I just finished a middle grade novel, and it is doing things that I have no control over whatsoever, and that's great. <laughs> um, but I'm also working on uh, two more novellas and a couple short stories and then I have promised uh, Kevin among other people that I will finish the next novel that I'm working on very soon so. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, is, Kevin is one of the forces for good in, in, this, in this genre world and um, y you, he doesn't ask for promises lightly and it's kind of terrifying <laughs> I just want to read it, that's all. <laughs> I just... She, she, write more. Yeah, she gave me this idea. I'm like, well, can I read it soon, please? You know, and that's, that's all. It wasn't that much pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just kidding. <laughs> soon. Chuck, so you actually burst on the scene just like four or five years ago, and you've now written, what, like 6,000 things? So, uh, yeah, yeah. 6,000. And so, yeah. how much more, and what do we have to look forward to? Uh, my next novel is called Laser Cats vs. Fire Clowns. <laughs> I wrote it while I was up here. It will be out tomorrow. Uh, no, I've got um, my uh, psychic, uh, my book about a psychic who can see how you're going to die when she touches you, Miriam Black. I've got two more books in that, and then that series is done at book six. Uh, I have a new writing book coming out in the fall um, called Damn Fine Story, which has a fancy elk on the front for some reason. Um, the book contains non-fancy elk, just to be clear. Uh, I've got a novel, sort of a pre-apocalyptic Station Eleven meets the stand uh, epic kind of book coming out called Exeunt, uh, coming out next uh, summer. So that's me. I was expecting so much more. Yeah, I, I'm just capping it. I don't want to take up time. <laughs> He's only telling us what's coming out in the next, like, six months, just so we don't get overwhelmed. Kevin. Can I just say that I'm, like, a, a huge fanboy of both of these fine authors right oh, here? Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I think that uh, Fran... It's kind of uh, mutual. This is the... Very. <laughs> it, uh, Fran's updraft is so such a beautiful, uh, beautifully written world and imagined world, and... and, and Terrifying. They're sky mouths. They just, they just appear and eat you. I love it. And I'm, and I'm terrified, and I had to change my pants. But, is that, but that, that is, that's Fran, all right? It's just gorgeous, and then suddenly you, you need new shorts. It bites you in the ass. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then Chuck's uh, Miriam Black stuff is fantastic. What uh, an amazingly uh, just punch you in the gut 
and everywhere else kind of uh, prose. <laughs> it's, it's seriously uh, it's so different from the way I write, and, and I was like, man, this is great. I, I just love uh, his turns of phrase and so on. Um, and I, I love getting to travel where Miriam travels because these are uh, well-researched locations, uh, which is something that I like to do too. So uh, I highly recommend the Miriam Black books if you haven't tried those yet. But uh, Thank okay, you. yeah, you bet. <laughs> um, so in terms of what I'm doing, oh my gosh, it's a lot of stuff. I haven't had a book out since January of 2016, so you might have thought, well, he's not really doing anything. But boy, I've been working a lot. It's just all coming out now. So we have Besieged right now, of course. Um, next month, August 1st, well, that's like two weeks. Uh, on August 1st, Urban Enemies comes out. It's an, an anthology where if you guys are urban fantasy fans, um, all of the stories are told from the point of view of the villain of your favorite urban fantasy series. So for me, I wrote about Loki, and it's his uh, plans to uh, basically try to convince Lucifer to join him in the cause of Ragnarok. Uh, so that was kind of fun. But uh, Jim Butcher has a story in there about, uh, told from the point of view of Joey Marcone. And, uh, you know, Kelly Armstrong's got one. Shauna McGuire's in there. Jonathan Mayberry. There's so many great... Um, authors in that anthology. So that's out August 1st. Um, and then I have A Plague of Giants coming out on so October good. 17th. And uh, thank this you, is, man. This is like nothing you've seen before from Kevin. It is extraordinary. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I have, I have, it really is my baby. The first version of this uh, I wrote before I wrote Hounded. And I, I needed to kind of write Iron Druid quite a bit to get good enough to do the thing I had in my mind. Basically, we have a continent that is beset on either coast by an invasion of giants, but two different races of giants, and they have different reasons for coming. But they come all at once, and then you have this continent that was once at peace that suddenly has to figure out how are we going to survive this. And they have a, a magic system called Kennings, and the, the trilogy is called the Seven Kennings. Um, and uh, we have... 11 different first-person points of view. <laughs> now, the reason for I this... I see no problem with this. Yeah. The, the reason for this is that I was trying to duplicate in a prose format the experience of having a bard tell you, you know, the epic each night is entertainment the way uh, Homer did for the Iliad and the Odyssey way back in ancient Greece. So I have a bard character, the Raelic bard, who is basically going to stand up and on top of the wall of a city, and he's looking out at a sea of refugees. He has the ability to project his voice, but without, you know, a microphone, of course, but he can magically be heard by folks. And then the other thing that he can do is he can change, he can cast a seeming so that he can appear in the form and speak in the voice of people that he's met. So that's how he's a framing device, but also a character, uh, but a framing device for all of these different people to tell their stories. And they're not kings. They're not, you know, leaders. These are the stories of folks who just were put in extraordinary situations and had to figure a way out of, of what's going on. So I made my own map because that was a huge geek out. <laughs> okay. I finally get to draw my map, you know. But because I did my own map, my publisher said, hey, we got some budget left because they were expecting to have to pay somebody else to do the map. So we still got some money left. Why don't we spend it on some art? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, what, what they did is they hired Yvonne Gilbert, who's this lovely illustrator, to uh, do head and shoulder shots of the 11 different narrators uh, in A Plague of Giants. And I've been revealing a new one each night on my tour. So, ha-ha. <laughs> You guys, I w you will get a closer look at this when we do the signings. I'll have this on my table, and you can take a look, better look, okay? But this is Gondol Ved, and uh, he's pushing 60. He's, uh, he is a linguist, and what he is trying to do is desperately figure out how to communicate to this one uh, race of giants that's coming over just sort of killing everybody, and they're not even talking. It's like, maybe if we could talk, maybe we could stop the war. I mean, or at least find out why they're doing what they're doing. Let's figure something out. So he, he does figure out that they're speaking a, a form that's drifted from a very ancient language that they now consider a dead language, but obviously it's not. So uh, I'd like to is, point out, by the way, that's a, a mustard stain. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. That is a mustard stain. Yeah, Gondol is fond of mustard. He so likes these mustard. Fun little details in here. Um, and then we have Gorin Mogan, who is, um, th- I've already revealed this one before. Uh, Gorin Mogan is the giant who is on the cover of A Plague of Giants, and he is attacking the opposite coast from where Gondol Vet is. Uh, but he's doing it very purposefully, and he does, he is able to communicate with folks um, about why. But uh, basically, his, he lives on a volcanic island, and it's resource poor, and he's waiting for the volcano to explode, and when it does, he's like, let's go, everybody! And they invade, but they say that they're refugees. But they're refugees with a plan. And the, the plan is to pretend we're here peacefully, but really, they're just building defenses the whole time, and they're just going to stay, and you're never going to get him out of there. So... He's a much more clever, scheming kind of fellow than the other giants, uh, but he obviously creates all kinds of problems for folks. So I've had this in my head. A whole bunch of this stuff has been in my head forever. Um, and I'm so glad that it's going to come out in October and you guys will get a chance to read it. If you like my Iron Druid stuff, I hope you will give this a try. Um, but then also in the Iron Druid vein, I got more. The Squirrel on the Train, coming out November 30th. Uh, that's uh, told from Oberon's point of view. Uh, if, how many of you read the Purloin Poodle? <laughs> Quite a few of you. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so the Purloin Poodle was me trying to write a mystery, and I had so much fun doing it. I said, let's do that again. So I have written The Squirrel on the Train. Uh, it's set in Portland, and it's another Oberon's meaty mystery that uh, he now has help uh, from Starbuck, the little Boston Terrier, and Orla to uh, help him out. Uh, and Atticus helps a little. You know, but, but to solve the mystery. So, what do you um, pay these guys in? Kibble? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So, <laughs> sausage. <laughs> they know. I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's available now from Subterranean Press if you'd like. Uh, you could order the hardcover. They just do limited editions of those. So, that'll be uh, available uh, November 30th, or you can order it, but it'll get shipped to you on November 30th. And then, of course, it'll be an ebook and audio as well. So, that's what I've got going on. That's amazing. Thank you. So before we go to questions from the audience, I have had a request. Oh. I hear I'm so some sorry, people on this stage really like knock-knock jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I have promised oh, there would no. be one <laughs> knock-knock joke at least. <clears throat> We're looking at you. This is you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. It's your fault. It's, it's your fault. fault. It's your fault. Knock-knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. Interrupting Moo! Oh. <laughs> God damn it, Fran. <laughs> I'm totally going to make this a thing now. I'm going to make everybody do knock-knock jokes. <laughs> that was for you, Andy. Okay, questions from the audience. Anyone have... Well, good evening, folks. Uh, my question is about um, science fiction and... Um, and situational um, reoccurrences. Do you think that there's any connection with science fiction and astrology? Personally, I don't uh, worship astrology, but I mean, um, do you do you relate astrology and science fiction and uh, reoccurrences in uh, r- real life? And if so, how would you how would you defy that? I personally don't. Um, I, I, reoccurrences, yeah, you see patterns uh, happen all the time, archetypes and so on and so forth, and um, I, it, it's fun to kind of mess with those a little bit. Um, I forgot, I got one more thing coming out. Um, <laughs> I, I, have, I have another series that I'm writing with Delilah Dawson, and we're making fun of tropes, you know, things that happen a lot in epic fantasy, for example. And I know your question is about science fiction, I, so I apologize for using a fantasy example, but... Um, the, the, the first book is called Kill the Farm Boy because dang it farm boys are always becoming chosen ones and then upsetting the natural order or whatever the established order is we're going to kill that kid um, but then you know a lot of other stuff that we're, we're making fun of established patterns that are out there so that's coming out next summer so yeah I, I do in general see that but I don't not necessarily astrology for me yeah, nothing really for me in terms of astrology. I mean, I think you can maybe use it to create characters as sort of a basis, just in terms of there's different you know, ways of looking at astrology and people uh, under different signs, but nothing particular for me. 
So I have a friend out in California. She's actually um, Greg Van Eckhout's wife, Lisa, who is an uh, astronomer with the, the um, telescope out there. And one of her great pleasures in life is to tell people that their astrological sign is wrong because <laughs> the Earth has rotated past where the original dates were set and she reassigns people their new signs while she's standing in front of them. And it gives her great glee to watch their faces fall. Um, at the same time, <laughs> you can like ask new, her about like new, this. Like you're the lobster. You're, like like you're, you're, you're actually a Gemini instead of, you know, and you can see people go, no, I'm not. Um, at the same time, I think that it is human nature, and I, I hope I'm answering your question, but I think it's human nature to see patterns in everything. Um, one of the themes in Updraft is, this is a scarcity society where a lot of things are going wrong, but they don't know exactly how much is going wrong because they don't know how much they've lost. So they fall back on um, the idea of luck and the idea of, and superstitions. And I'm not saying that astrology is necessarily a big superstition, but it is a pattern. It's a, it's a way that we use patterns like we used to use myth. And there's, it's not an accident that astrology is tied to Greek gods in, in our understanding of it. Um, we, you fall back on that when you don't have the answers yet. You don't have all the structure. You look for some pattern that will explain the unexplainable. And I think that that um, gives us a sense of structure and stability in our lives, even if there isn't necessarily one. I mean, you could wake up one morning and find out that the, the entire government of the United States has been taken over by another government, and you, you know, would be completely astounded by that if you didn't Fire have that clowns. structure. <laughs> Fran, that was the worst knock-knock joke I've ever heard. So sorry. <laughs> But I, th I think that it's a good question because we do look for patterns and astrology is one of our earliest ones. We look for the patterns in the sky and we actually take these dots in the sky, these stars, and make figures out of them. And that act of pattern making is something that's as old as, as our cultures are. So I think that's cool. Uh, this question's for uh, Kevin. In your first book, Hounded, it's just sort of a throwaway line that uh, he's talking about that Chicago wizard that advertises in the yellow pages. <laughs> when, when you're writing your novels, do, you, do any of you consider that you're part of a larger universe that your character's impacting something that happens in a completely different, different branch? It, do, do you see yourself as part of a larger arc or are you self-contained? I'm self-contained and I actually, that, that was, I, I put in a, a like that's, I consider that like a pop culture reference. Um, and I refer to all kinds of things, but I don't consider Atticus and Harry Dresden to be in the same universe at all. I mean, just look at the vampires for crying out loud. Uh, the Fae are completely different and so on and so forth. So that was me making a, you know, a, a nod and an allusion to another person's work. Um, I've got those all throughout my book, but yeah, they're not, I don't really think that my Iron Druid universe is compatible with any others that are out there. Um, so I just wanted to know, for the three of you, which Star Wars movie is your favorite? <laughs> oh, man. I like the one with the, the, the little baby tree. <laughs> Fran. <laughs> Fran, Fran, damn it! Can, can I make a new curse? Like Fran, damn it! Knock, knock. Oh. <laughs> well, who's there? I don't know. Damn it! <laughs> damn it, Fran, Fran, damn it! Uh, all right, for me, it kind of like depends on my mood, but it goes anywhere between. I love The Force Awakens, Return of the Jedi, and Empire Strikes Back. If I just sort of like like a fidget spinner and turn whatever one it lands on, is my favorite. I think to be to be honest, the, the first the first Star Wars I ever saw is still my favorite, even though it has whiny Luke in it going to Toshi Station and everything else. It's just you know the first time you see a planet. <laughs> it it is that that moment when you're sitting in the theater and the the, the ship just comes right over your head is really it, it was formative. Empire Strikes Back for me. <laughs> oh, that's an applause line. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, what are your rituals? Are you, some of you outliners, or do you um, have a, a word count per day? Or 
Chuck has a writing shed. He does. With a murder pit underneath <laughs> it. T- we weren't supposed he, to talk about the murder pit, guys. <laughs> well, he let me vacation there. And, uh, Damn, you I think you really were vacationing. Good stuff he, he was really you. just siphoning your words. That, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's like a whole vat of Kevin words there now. Fran, damn it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, uh, every morning is coffee, that's first. Uh, then, um, yeah, it, it varies. I actually find that if I do the same thing over and over, I kind of get a little bit blocked. So I do something different almost every day, which might sound weird, but um, I try to. I write in different places. Um, if I am blocked on something, I you know you go for a walk or whatever. You get the blood pump, and that helps. Uh, but I also uh, I wrote hounded as you know one of those seat of the pants kinds of things, just making it up as I went along. But then when I, once I got a contract and I had deadlines and there was money attached to those deadlines, I think I, I should write faster. And so um, I I started to outline, and the outline is not something that I feel that I have to adhere to. It is just something to keep me productive each day. If I'm stuck on chapter three, I've already outlined what happens in chapter seven. And if chapter seven is, is a lot more fun to my mind right at that time, well, I'll go right that. There's nothing that says I have to go in order. So I am now a nonlinear writer, but I just try to get a consistent word count each day. And that way, I'm always getting closer to the end, and I eventually get done instead of you know, being stuck on chapter three for a week. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what I do. It's, uh, I, I have an outline to keep myself, my days structured and productive, but otherwise everything just changes all the time because I need different stimuli to keep myself active. Uh, my first published novel, uh, Blackbirds, took me six years to write. Uh, and like five of those years, um, I, it's like, it was like wandering into the mall and not knowing what you wanted to buy. Like I just would just kind of wander, like is this Bed Bath & Beyond? How did I get here? <laughs> and then I would wander back out. Uh, and the reason that that was happening is because I wasn't outlining. And so um, the way I solved that and the way I learned how to outline was I did what every struggling novelist does at that point, which was I won a screenwriting competition. And uh, <laughs> in winning a screenwriting competition, I got a mentorship uh, for a year with a uh, screenwriter named Steven Suska, whose uh, expertise was in adapting pre-existing material to the screen. So my goal was to sort of cheat him, <laughs> which was going to be like, okay, we're going mean, to, I don't care about screenplays, those are dumb. What I want to do is uh, adapt my uh, piece of crap unfinished novel to the screenplay so it can be finished, and then I'm going to write it again as a novel. Um, ju- again, just like every wannabe novelist would want to do. So uh, I did win, and we did do that, and the first thing he told me was, like, well, you're going to outline. He said, that's what we're going to do first. And I said, no, 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 I don't know if you know how we do this in novel land. Uh, in Hollywood land, you guys outline. In novel land, we just listen to the clouds. We just, we just whisper to the bugs in the grass, and they tell us the book, and that's how that works. And he said, well, how's that going for you? Uh, I said, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll outline. That's a good idea. So um, I like bit the belt, and I drank the whiskey, and I punched the frozen beef and the montage. And then uh, like two days later, I had an outline. But in having an outline, I had a completed book. I mean, not a fully completed book, but I had the story like in front of me in two pages. And then I was able to literally, within 30 days, write a complete novel from that. So it went from like a six-year process to, oh, I have to outline. Uh, now I, I can do this. And I do that every time. So I outline every time, um, and it helps me contextualize the book. Now, the lesson there is not that authors should outline. The lesson there is that authors, when something isn't working, should change their process. I am not an outliner. Um, I, I do outline and then I throw them away. I do a lot of brainstorming as well. Um, I try and figure out where I'm going to go the night before so that I can let my brain sort of think about it while I'm sleeping. And then I get up and I find that if I write before my family gets up, I usually write um, very fast and very fluidly. So I try and do that. Now that we have a puppy, if you follow me on any sort of social media, you know I have a dog um, that has changed completely. But um, one of the things that, that is sort of a habit and a ritual and a pattern for me, and this is your fault. Oh, God, what did I do now? <laughs> it's your blog. Uh-huh. Um, I was, back in 2011, when I, I, was write, I, I had been writing for years and years and years and hadn't finished anything because it was never good enough. And then I hit this blog called Terrible Minds, and there was a Sucks. headline... It was terrible. The, there was a headline there that said something like, don't cheat on your book. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, he's like, don't cheat on your book with another book behind yes. the shed. And, or something. And, and it didn't mean don't write multiple things at the same time. It basically meant, to me, finish your shit. And that was when I started finishing stories. It didn't matter how bad I thought it was. I was just going to get to the end and finish it. And you know what happens when you start finishing stories is they, you can revise them and then you can sell them. And it got really exciting after that. And um, even when I started writing longer things, I found that working to the end of a project and having that sense of completion is really part of the ritual for me. It, even if I have to go back and rewrite the entire thing again, um, I know that I can do it then. And every time I set myself a challenge, and really every book I write has a challenge aspect to it. I'm a gamer. There is no aspect of my life that I don't try and game. And one of the things that gamers do is, what can I break this time? And so that trying to figure out, can I do this? This is the impossible goal that I've set for myself. Can I actually get to the end of it and finish it as part of the ritual for me? So I, I do anything to get there. So what I'm hearing you say. I owe you everything, Chuck Wendig. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I haven't seen any royalties. <laughs> or... Anything? She gives you glorious knock-knock <laughs> jokes. That's, that's true. I, there's so many that's mornings on true. Twitter. That, oh, the other ritual that I don't do very well, but I should, is don't go on Twitter in the morning until you've written. <laughs> uh, <But>. Yeah. <laughs> what were your jobs before you became full-time <laughs> authors? <laughs> do you want to... Yeah, I was a high school English teacher for 17 years. Yay! Yeah, oh, thank you for doing that. Uh, I, you know what? I miss the kids a lot. Um, I it kept you young, right? All the gray in my beard after I stopped teaching. Um, they, they keep you young. But uh, I, I don't miss taking attendance or uh, any faculty meeting ever. Uh, they were always a waste of my time, but, but I do miss a lot of that. Uh, so I, I did uh, the teaching thing, and then I also delivered pizza. And then I also did like the announcing at the high school football games and all, well, all the sports really, um, where they needed an announcer because I was desperate for cash because I had a kid and man, diapers, right? Whew. And they don't pay teachers a lot, which you're probably aware of. Um, so that, that, I was doing all of that and then writing as well, uh, about an hour or whatever after dinner and whenever I could squeeze it in. And then that way, I finally got done with my book, and uh, you know, here I am. Um, I was a jeweler's assistant, a sailing instructor. I um, taught programming at both the college and the graduate um, school levels. And one of my favorite jobs is I was a high school writing teacher in Baltimore County for a number of years and taught writing there, which was absolutely extraordinary experience. There were a couple of other things. I, I was a nighttime proofreader for a company on the Beltway around DC, and my entire job relied on the ability to keep the L in the word public. <laughs> it's very important. Um, it's true. And um, in between, I, I've done um, game design for a company in London and a couple of other things here and there but absolutely no involvement whatsoever with Star Wars. <laughs> None. Uh, I've had a lot of jobs, some weird, some not. Um, worked in game design. Um, I've had random jobs. But the first job uh, that I had out of college, which is the most nonsense job uh, ever, uh, I, they, and, uh, uh, people were looking for a writer for a newspaper internally, their internal company newspaper. And that uh, organization was called the ICRDA, the International Cash Registers Dealers Association, which is literally, they do not produce cash registers. They uh, literally are like a champion organization for cash registers. Did you say cat registers? Ca no, cat registers would have been awesome. <laughs> this was cash registers, which are like the dullest thing ever. So I said, yeah, no, I can write about that. I'm a writer. I'm, I'm up for that challenge. Uh, so I took the job, and then I noticed I was moving a lot of boxes, and I was like cleaning things, and I was lifting heavy things, and there, I was like, I, I noticed this so far has not taken me down the journey of writing about cash registers. Uh, I just mostly seem to be moving cash registers. Uh, and then eventually one guy, uh, one of the people who worked there, an executive uh, who sold ad space in their newspaper, uh, took me aside and said, you know we just hired you because interns don't tend to do anything and temps don't tend to like to stay around. So we hired you under the auspices that 
you would be a newspaper writer, but really you're just kind of like a, a, a mule for us, really. <laughs> and I said, well, that sucks, but I, I do need a job, so I'm going to stay. Uh, and then, then came the day they were having a conference in town, the International Cash Registers Dealers Association's Conference, which is about the best group of people I'm sure you could ever imagine. A bunch of rich white people who care only about cash registers. So they said, your job is going to be to drive this big white tour van around Charlotte, North Carolina and show them the glorious queen city of Charlotte, North Carolina. So we've parked the van, here's the keys, it's in that uh, parking garage over there. Just pick it up and you're gonna start, you're gonna go to these places and pick up these people. So uh, you know that thing where you go out of a parking garage and there's that little lifty little gate thing and you put in the card and the ticket? There's also a sign above there that says like you can't be of a certain size vehicle. Oh no, you were uh, that guy? I was that guy. I drove through that and then I started to hear this <laughs> and I, like a piece of cholesterol in a bad artery, I just lodged the van in there and then I was like, uh, I just kind of sat there for a little while. And then they had a phone, so I went, because I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I went and used the payphone, and I called my boss, who was back at the office, and I said, I quit. And then I just <laughs> chucked the keys, and I went home. That was my first job. I, I really want a cat register now, because the whole time Susie <laughs> said that, I was thinking about, you know, punch it. Meow, 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 bing. Can I get change for a tabby? Um, I just had a quick question. Are any of you guys using the idea of the fire clowns versus the laser cats? <laughs> I feel like that's, that's a Creative Commons open source. I think mean, this whole room. I personally would love to see all of the f fire clowns versus laser cats stories that come out of this evening. I think that would all be All of you amazing. tweet it right now. Yes. Tweet so I it. think it's up for grabs <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> Except okay, you. thank you so much. You. We will see you upstairs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.